Catholic Family Podcast presents Lent Around the World Daily Traditional Catholic Meditations Read by our friends from across the globe The Passion and Death of Our Lord Jesus Christ by the Most Reverend Albin Goodyear Part 27 The Scourging and Crowning Barabbas, the highwayman and murderer and promoter of sedition and revolt, was set at liberty. And Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, who had done all things well, whom no man could convict of any sin, of whom his enemies had said that for his good works they would accuse him not, was delivered over to the servants of the law. There was nothing now left to be done but for the preliminaries of the execution to begin. First he must be scourged, both because Pilate had consented to it and because such was the ordinary treatment of one condemned to death. But in the scourging, Jesus, the son of David, was not to enjoy the benefit of the Jewish law. According to that law, even in the worst of cases, scourging was confined to forty stripes, save one. And if they see that the offender be worthy of stripes, they shall lay him down, and shall cause him to be beaten before them. According to the measure of the sin shall the measure also of the stripes be, yet so that they exceed not the number of forty, lest thy brother depart shamefully torn before thy eyes. According to the Jewish law, the punishment was limited. It was to be inflicted in the presence of the judges. To the end, they were to remember that the criminal was a fellow man, and that his body was as sacred as their own. The Roman law had no such limits. Moreover, the prisoner was no Roman citizen, a title which alone would have saved him from the degradation. He was only a Jew only a Galilean, only one of those hill country people who were forever giving trouble. He was one of those on whom these Roman soldiers could vent their cruelty and contempt to their heart's content. The evangelists, one and all, passed the scene over. They mentioned the fact of the scourging and no more, either because there had been no witness to give them the details, or, more probably, because the scene was too terrible, too horrible, too painful, to be described. But Jesus himself had not passed it over. Again and again in his prophecies of the Passion, he had come back to it, as if from the beginning it had been something from which his human nature had shrank. They shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, to be mocked and scourged and crucified. From St. Matthew. They shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and shall mock him, and spit on him, and scourge him. From St. Mark. He shall be delivered to the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and scourged, and spat upon, and after they have scourged him, they will put him to death. From St. Luke. In the spirit of the Gospels, we also may be reticent. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Mary, blessed among women, the most beautiful among the sons of men, declared by his enemies to be sinless, declared by his judges to be free from fault. Therefore, because he was all this and no more, was handed over to the soldiers of Pilate to be scourged. Thus far there was no real sentence of death. I will chastise him, therefore, and let him go. At the command of both Jews and Romans, Jesus Christ was stripped of his clothes. He was tied to a whipping post. He was beaten till his whole body became one gaping wound, till it fell exhausted to the ground, till brutalized men, brought up to cruelty, reveling in it as sport, boasting of it as if it were a mark of bravery, restricted to no limit, were satisfied. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was left in their hands that they might vent their brutality upon him, unrestrained. Yet even this was not enough, and here the evangelists take up the story once more, as if for what follows they have the evidence of eyewitnesses. The soldiers of the governor had carried out their orders. They had done their work of scourging, but Jesus was still upon their hands. One might almost suspect that Pilate delayed to bring his prisoner back into his presence for the final sentence with a special purpose. Perhaps he had hoped that to pass that sentence might not be needed. 
Many a slave had before died beneath the lash, and he knew the temper of his soldiers. If he left Jesus long enough at their mercy, perhaps they too might do him to death. But they were cautious, like Annas and Caiaphas, like Herod and his satellites, like the priests and elders clamoring at that moment before Pilate's door. They would not risk the reactions of their capricious governor. They would have good sport of their own, but they would be careful that Jesus should not die. During the trial, Pilate had repeatedly said that this man claimed to be a king. The people shouting in the street below had abused him for claiming the title. It would be a fine game, suited to the occasion. If he were in truth a king, so much the better. They had no such scruples as those of their governor. They would let this king see how they thought kings like him should be treated. If he were in truth a king, and evidently the governor had his suspicions that he was, then they could pour out on him with the greater zest their utter contempt, both for him and for these Jewish malcontents whom they despise with all their hearts. There was excitement and a new interest in the soldiers' courtyard. Some stopped their gambling, all came together to take part in this new burlesque. They would crown this Jesus a king indeed, and they would be his courtiers. Every man should play what character he would in the solemn farce. Then the soldiers of the governor, taking Jesus into the court of the palace, gathered together unto him the whole band, and stripping him they put a scarlet cloak about him. Thus they began the performance. Once upon a time, loving hands had wrapped that tender body in swaddling clothes and laid it to rest in a manger. And angels had told shepherds that by that sign they would know the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. Wise men had come to that same place from afar and had found him and had rejoiced with exceeding great joy. They had, falling down, adored him, and opening their treasures they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So the prophet had foretold, so John the Baptist had announced the coming of the king. And he shall rule from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. Before him the Ethiopian shall fall down, and his enemies shall lick the ground. The kings of Tarsus and the islands shall offer presents. The kings of the Arabians and of Saba shall bring gifts. And all kings of the earth shall adore him, and all nations shall serve him. For he shall deliver the poor from the mighty, and the needy that had no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and he shall save the souls of the poor. He shall save their souls from usuries and iniquity, and their name shall be honorable in his sight. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Arabia. For him they shall always adore. They shall bless him all the day. Yet what a contrast to this and other prophecies was here. Herod the Tetrarch had wished for a long time to see Jesus. He had seen him that morning, and all he had done had been to clothe him in the garment of a fool. And Herod with his army set him at naught, putting on him a white garment, and sent him back to Pilate. Now these Roman soldiers prepared to treat him no better. To Herod, it was no more than a montebank. To them, it was a puppet and a show. A second time they stripped him. This king must first be clothed in royal robes. They threw a scarlet cloak across his naked and scarred shoulders, some cast-off garment of an officer of the guard. They set him against the wall, upon a tub for a throne. Him of whom an angel had said, The Lord shall give unto him the throne of David his father, and he shall reign in the house of Jacob forever. Him, who had promised to his followers, Amen I say to you, that you who have followed me, in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit on the seat of his majesty, you also shall sit on twelve seats, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Yet so he was now enthroned and he must needs be crowned. With what should they crown him? In a corner of the courtyard was a heap of prickly bramble, 
put there to supply the fire. The soldier had a happy idea. He took his sword, cut away some of the twigs, beat them into a ball between his sword and his staff, for they were too thorny to be handled, and clapped them down upon the head of Jesus, hammering them about till they fitted like a helmet. Thou hast given him his heart's desire, and hast not withholden from him the will of his lips. For thou hast prevented him with blessings of sweetness, thou hast set upon his head a crown of precious stones. Thus was Jesus crowned, seated on his throne of shame. The enthronement had suggested coronation, the crowning suggested a scepter. There were rushes strewn about the floor to serve as a carpet. Another soldier picked up one of these and pushed it between the fettered hands. And behold, Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews, crowned in state on the very court of the Roman Pilate by Pilate's own Roman bodyguard. Were not his ambitions now satisfied? And plating a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. One idea followed another. The king had been crowned. He must now be duly honored by his courtiers and devoted subjects. They knew how this was to be done. Often enough they had stood on guard when men had paid obeisance to monarchs, when local chiefs and petty kings had done homage to their overlord. They had watched them approach in solemn order, one by one, clad in all the glory that became their rank, kneel to the mighty and offer him their sword, pay him their homage as to one who held their lives in his hands, utter the one salutation that was permitted to them. It was an easy thing for them to go through the mock ceremonial. What one did, another imitated, in solemn, derisive procession. And they came to him, and bowing the knee before him, they mocked him, and began to salute him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! There was special bitterness in the choice of the salutation they used. In ordinary life, these Roman soldiers would have paid no such honor to any Oriental monarch, not even to Herod, the tetrarch appointed by Caesar. What they did was an act of contempt, not to Jesus only, but to all his race, and it was shown by what followed. In the court of Caiaphas, the evangelist had for a moment let us see the treatment meted out by the Jewish sycophants. Here, once more, for a like brief moment, the veil is lifted. As each man rose from his knee, he invented some new device, vying with those who had gone before him, by which he might pour ridicule and insult on the man who sat, clothed in scarlet, crowned with thorns, and with a scepter in his hand, silent and unmoved against the wall of the court. One, as he stepped aside, would raise his arm and strike him, and a soldier's blow is heavy. The next would look up to him after his humble salutation, and as he rose from the ground, would cast his spittle in his face. A third, doing further homage by touching the scepter with his fingers, would seize the reed from the hands of Jesus and strike him with it on his thorn-pierced head. Then, all together, in Asiatic, not in Roman fashion, knowing well that the cause of all this trouble against Jesus was a matter of religion, would gather together around him, would put their fingers to their lips, would bow profoundly to the ground before this God, bidding him live forever, the Lord and Master of them all. And they gave him blows and did spit upon him, and they took the reed and struck his head, and bowing their knees, they worshipped him. This was the homage Jesus received when at last he had declared his title before men. Prophets and kings had foretold his coming. They had rejoiced that they had foreseen his day. And yet it had come to this. In Bethlehem, when he was born, angels had seen in that birth glory and joy both in heaven and on earth. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of goodwill. Good tidings of great joy, for this day is born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord in the city of David. So they had sung that multitude of the army. Before he left that city of David, his ancestor, Gentiles had come and looked for him, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to adore him. 
And yet, this was the issue. When he first appeared in the sight of men, after he had sent his herald before him to prepare his path as was the way of kings, one had come to him and said, Thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. In reward for his confession, he had been assured that he would see great things. Amen, amen, I say to you, you shall see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. But always there had been the other side. Not only had there been from the beginning a mighty Herod, who had spared nothing to compass this child's death, and whose successors had sworn within themselves that they would have none of him. On a famous occasion, another king, who had seen more than any of these, and had learnt and feared, had offered terms to this new claimant to the throne of all the world. He had come and parlayed with him. By show of power he had hoped to impose upon him, but behind that parlaying there was hidden fear and hatred. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, To thee will I give all this power and the glory of them, for to me they are delivered, and to whom I will I give them. If thou therefore wilt adore before me, all shall be thine. Since that attempt had failed, he had tried it in another way. On the mountain of temptation, the king of the world had begun with the temptation of bread and had ended with that of the kingdom. Once on the plain beyond the lake of Galilee, Jesus had himself given a sign of bread, whereupon his followers had risen up and cried, This is of a truth the prophet that is to come into the world, and had rushed forward to make him their king. Jesus, therefore, when he knew that they would come to take him by force and make him king, fled again into the mountain, himself alone. Seated on his throne in the soldier's court, with the scarlet cloak across his shoulders, the crown upon his head, the scepter in his hand, the courtiers paying their homage to him, the red blood running down his face, Jesus could look back on all that had been and count the friends and count the enemies that had gathered round his title of kingship. It was indeed and would ever be the battle of all time. He had come to send not peace, but a sword. And, as he had forewarned his own, it was a battle in which it would seem that he was forever beaten. But at the same time he had reassured them again and again, in defeat and shame would lie victory and honor. In the temple court, when his work had been well nigh done, on the last day of his preaching, as he looked forward to the doom about to fall upon him, he had said, Now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all things to myself. In the supper room the night before, he had repeated the same assurance. Let not your heart be troubled. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth do I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. If the world hate you, know ye that it hath hated me before you. Remember my word that I said to you, the servant is not greater than his master. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the hour cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doth a service to God. Amen, amen, I say to you, that you shall lament and weep, but the world shall rejoice. And you shall be made sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. In the world you shall have distress, but have confidence. I have overcome the world. Not long hence he would come back to his own, victorious and triumphant, a king indeed, and with the authority of a king he would issue his mandate. All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Going, therefore, teach ye all nations. And they would understand the meaning of the battle he had fought and won. His apostle, perhaps with the scene we have just witnessed in his mind, for he was fond of contrasts, would write in triumph for all the world to read in all time to come. He humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. 
for which cause God also hath exalted him, and hath given him a name, which is above all names, that, in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those that are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the glory of God the Father. It was all worthwhile. These poor men who played their game served him and his cause better than they knew. They would have their imitators throughout all time, no less than Annas and Caiaphas and Pilate. But because of what he endured, he would have his followers as well. They too would be stripped and scourged. They too would be crowned with thorns. But the sight of their king crowned before them would turn their sorrow into matter of thanksgiving. For this is thankworthy, if for conscience towards God a man endure sorrows, suffering wrongfully. If doing well you suffer patiently, this is thankworthy before God, for unto this are you called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving you an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile. When he suffered, he threatened not, but delivered himself to him that judged him unjustly. In this light, through the blood that blinded his eyes, he could look into the future and know that the kingdom would be won, the prophecy would be fulfilled. He shall reign in the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Jesus Christ, yesterday and today, and the same forever. <laughs>